Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey friends, Dave Kading. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that team has supported this particular podcast and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us. And they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we've brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their, uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic. And I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can give patients calls. They can check on uh, scribing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things, particularly in the myopia community. It's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things, checking on those myopic patients, seeing how they're doing, giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day, uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk. Consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Well, thanks again for joining us for this episode. I'm uh, very excited to be with my friend Maria Lou, and uh, thanks for being on the podcast again. Thanks for having me here, David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are recording live from the Vision by Design in the Exhibit Hall uh, at the 2023 meeting in Chicago. You are a staple of this meeting. Everybody always wants to hear you talk, and uh, it's always phenomenal. It's not ever the same thing. You always bring it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I uh, do want to mention October 2nd through the 5th in Dallas, Texas. That's where we're going to be hanging out next fall for the Vision by Design meeting. You're going to get invited back. So that's where you're going to be October 2nd through the 5th. And I would encourage you to join us for the next year's Vision by Design meeting. You can check out AAOMC's uh, website and uh, look into coming to that meeting to hear incredible lectures about all things my myopia control, and orthokeratology. Now, um, you seem to know a lot of what's going on in the myopia world. And whenever I talk to you, it's always that you know just a little bit more than I've ever been able to find out, especially if things are coming out of China, which they're leading the way in a lot of things. You know, they, they really crushed it in ortho K in a lot of ways. Uh, maybe before we really got going in ortho K and other aspects of myopia. One thing I'm hearing more and more about, and you know, I've thought maybe I should bring this into my office, is this red light therapy. Now let me give you a little background of why I'm enticed by this. Sure. So um, we've, we've all heard, and when we were in I, uh, optometry school and in, in medical school, about syntonics. My wife actually does syntonics in the vision therapy clinic for head injury patients. There's been some great research on utilizing light therapy for amblyopia, and it can help speed up those treatments. And we're seeing these things happen in our patients, especially these head injury patients where we do vision therapy for six or nine months. And when they do light therapy first, it really speeds it up. Their headaches go down. And so I got to thinking, oh my goodness, how cool would it be if we're bringing light-based therapy into other areas of my office? The other reason I think it's kind of sexy is because I do light-based therapy for dry eye with IPL or low light level therapy and uh, was like, wow, maybe we should be using light in our myopia clinic. And, but I, I just can't find tons of research showing its effectiveness. Like, is it, it, am I crazy to be thinking about this, or is there maybe something there sometime in the future? So to that was get a loaded question, wasn't yes, it? Yes. Uh, to get started, I want to make one uh, clarification. Yeah. 
the device or the treatment we're talking is not red light. Yeah. It's red laser. Uh huh. And when we're talking to parents about red light, um, they usually think it's red LED. Yeah. But this device is actually using red laser. Okay. So has there been have have they looked at red light being ineffective, whereas this red laser they believe is working, but the red light doesn't work. Unfortunately, the manu- most of the manufacturers of the red laser devices have not looked at whether just replacing with red laser or red laser replaced with red, red LED would that actually achieve the same efficacy. Mm. Um, I am not aware of any research um, in that area. Yeah. And so in their proposed mechanism of a why this red laser would work in myopia control yeah. and axial inhibition, they're all citing the studies that actually performed with a red LED. And they're equalizing the effect from LED to red laser. So there are studies on red LED? In animals. Okay. Yeah. So the... Um, the light studies in animal models on myopia control has not been very consistent. There are studies showing using the red LED, um, animals reared in LED would actually show a reduced hyperopic development and actually more myopic development. But there are also opposite results reported in different animal models in saying um, animals reared in L red LED actually showed a more hyperopia or a, a slower axial inhibition. So you get the opposite results depending on which lab and which animal model you're citing. Um, well, that so brings clarity. <laughs> that's that's yeah. helpful. Yeah, and same thing for blue light. Yeah, I've heard that blue light has this maybe. Maybe not? Yeah, so it's a big problem in our field in terms of selective referencing. When I'm promoting Mm. a device, I can find plenty of evidence supporting the uh, mechanism, the plausibility of the use of this device. You just have to ignore. Yes. Yes. Other studies yeah. that say that it's so obviously works if you have a hundred studies out, ninety-five percent of them support the use of the device. You, it's not too bad that you ignore the rest five. Mm-hmm. But if you're seeing a field that's almost like a very balanced, a fifty-fifty reporting opposite evidence, you cannot just simply ignore the controversial yeah. um, findings. And there aren't a hundred studies, right? It's no. very limited, yeah. I- even in this, yeah. yet alone to be fifty-fifty. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. So um, tell us a little bit about how, uh, you know, how did somebody start thinking about using red light to affect these animals? And why did this even, you know, kind of come up? What is the thought process behind this? The fundamental um, effort in investigating the impact from light in amitropization is pretty intuitive because we know the current trend of a dramatic uh, shift in the hyperopia, hyperopic, or sorry. So the current trend in the overall increase in the prevalence of myopia, um, obviously it's something environmentally induced yeah. because um, human genetic makeup just simply does not change at this rate. We're seeing an on average of a 1% increase in the myopia prevalence globally. and. Uh, so the most plausible cause of seeing this global trend of a myopia increase is something's happening with the visual development of young children, mm-hmm. and that's causing a dramatic shift in the end point of this amitropization. And uh, whether it's the intensity of the light mm-hmm. uh, that's changing, or whether it's the spectrum distribution, indoor, outdoor lighting, there are totally different energy distribution, or it's um, simply because when kids are outdoor, they're just not reading or using their electronic devices as much, that we don't know. But because um, you know, um, optical system is driven by visual signals, and how they view the world, what is the intensity, what is the spectrum distribution, obviously deserve a lot of um, investigation. Yeah. And so we want to know if we're changing the spectrum distribution and animals growing in different 
um, composite of the light, whether it actually shows a difference in the process of axial growth, yeah. and which it is. But depending on what light intensity you're using, even for the same spectrum, for example, the same blue light, if you use a very bright blue light versus not so bright blue light, and you get totally different results. Mm. That shows not only the spectrum uh, is important, the intensity itself is also important. Right. How the two factors interact together, it's very, very poorly understood. Mm -hmm. So the transition here in to a product was, well, because we want intensity be what mm -hmm. it was, we're going to go to a laser rather than an LED light. And that's what the, the maybe the thought process was. And h how did they get from LED to a laser? I, I, you may not know. I'm presuming yeah. you may yeah. know. So this device was not invented for the purpose of a myopia or axial okay. control. It was available in China um, to my knowledge, at least for more than 20, 25 years. The device was uh, initially intended for the treatment of amblyopia, mm, the mm -hmm. treatment of lazy eye, although it w did not really take up a lot of market. Mm -hmm. And to my knowledge, there haven't been many hospitals or binocular vision clinics using such device for the treatment of amblyopia. And to my knowledge, there has been very, very little clinical studies supporting the efficacy of using the red laser for amblyopia treatment. Okay. But because it has been around for very long, and the original publication of this device to support its safety, they're all saying, oh, it has been used for a very long time for the treatment of a lazy eye. And people naturally think, since it has been used in children for so many years, it must be safe. Mm. But just because a treatment has been around for a very long time doesn't mean you actually have a lot of patients mm -hmm. receiving such treatment. Mm -hmm. Or that it is safe, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm, uh, I'm sensing a little bit in, uh, in you that this may not be your favorite thing. What are you concerned about? What What are the concerns here? Because why can't we just, you know, you know, why can't we just shoot this thing into mm -hmm. the eye and hope to see that it works? One, it could be they develop more myopia because sometimes this, this same, sounds like some of the studies point towards red light pointing mm -hmm. towards that. But are you concerned about the intensity? That's what it would be. Yes. Yeah, so me. my concerns are certainly multifold. Number one thing is we need to really understand the energy distribution of the red laser. Um, how is that different comparing to red LED? We know laser energy is a very, very condensed. They usually are emitted in the pulse. So um, for this pulse, you get a very high intensity of the laser energy, and it's actually condensed in a very small area on the fovea. Mm. Because in this treatment, we're asking children to fixate, to look right into the laser beam. And so the energy, not only the energy is very high at a very um, short duration of time, and it's also very, very condensed in a very small area of the retina. Yeah. So um, it's like you are creating such a high intensity in a pulse for, form, a form um, that nobody knows whether the um, macular or the fovea can take this much energy without causing irreversible damage. Yeah. And yeah. um, the energy of this red laser is actually comparable to what we use for the red laser pointer. They belong to the same class of the um, laser um, uh, diode. Yeah, those ones have, a, have something on them that says, don't look at them. Don't yes. point them into the eye. Exactly. <laughs> when we're using anything, you know, even for the shipping of a, uh, like a laser device, even for something in the energy range mm. of used as a laser pointer, the first thing you teach your children is do not look at the laser. But instead, uh, we're asking the children to look right into the laser for a prolonged duration, three minutes, and you're asking them to do twice a day five days a week for many, many years. Yeah. And so my first concern yeah. is we really need to do safety study in animals and in human, well, after we know it's safe, reasonably safe in animals, to verify the safety of using such device in such a frequent and prolonged manner before we talk about efficacy. 
Yeah, and even from the sense of efficacy, uh, the 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 theory that red light LED doesn't even sound like it is a strong message, right? Because it's very so variable in the research. Correct. And for this specific red laser device in clinical testing, it did show a very significant inhibition in axial length, so dramatic that a very high percentage of the subjects showed a significant shortening of the axial length, all the way up to 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters. And so this is itself is also very concerning. A uh, first impression to most practitioners was like, wow, this is so effective. Not only it's slowing down the axial elongation, it actually makes the eyes um, so much shorter. So we know a uh, longer eyes, you know, increase the risk of a complication, blah, blah. But for someone who really, you know, want to dig into this results a little bit more, we're using this device to children at an age where their eyes are just naturally growing and expanding as part of the body getting taller. Yeah. It's almost like you're using a device not only to um, slow down or halt myopia-related axial growth, you're also halting physiological axial growth. It's almost like you're using a device, um, taking an analogy of a hand, and while the child is growing taller, the hand is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. So. For anyone who really want to understand whether this is considered a therapeutic effect or it's truly causing some shrinking of the eyeballs, that's eventually a fundamental pathological change. When we're talking about this shrinking of the eye, are we looking, is there choroidal thickening? You know, that's my concern is that much of a physiological change must be associated with an anatomical uh, adjustment to the eye responding to this laser being like, whoa, this isn't good. Yeah. I'm kind of wondering. So certainly um, this device is capable of eliciting uh, a very dramatic choroidal thickening, uh, which we can come back later in understanding whether this kind of a choroidal thickening is good or bad. But the amount of choroidal thickening elicited by this device cannot explain the overall shrinking of the axial length. Oh. So there must be something else going on. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Even for um, young, healthy um, children's eyes, the choroid is very capable of uh, actually causing vasodilation. Yeah. So the capacity for choroidal thickening is certainly higher than that of the adults. Uh, even that at least to uh, my knowledge in my lab, we're able to elicit anywhere from 20 microns to 50 microns of a chordal thickening. But here we're talking about 200 to 500 microns of axial length change. And the only time I'm seeing a dramatic chordal thickening that goes beyond just like a simple response to optical treatment or low dose atropine is when I'm seeing a dramatic inflammation, mm. inflammatory response of the choroid, yeah. that would like make me think yeah, that choroiditis, too. or um, in some severe cases of a CSRs, you yeah. do see very dramatic choroidal thickening. And so that actually leads to the hypothesis, or at least something that's worth testing, whether this device and its impact on the cortical thickening is actually inflammatory kind of stimulus. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Uh, it, it sounds to me like we've got a lot, lot more work Absolutely. before we would even be able to make any strong conclusions yeah. on safety of this. And even so, I, it seems like we're that's maybe not yeah. even going to be the case based on what we do know from the from from the research now. Yeah. So a very important thing I want to clarify. Just because all of the current available evidence-based interventions for myopia control are all capable of eliciting corridor thickening, and uh, right now we're almost considering the transient cor corridor thickening as almost a biomarker or predictor for the future efficacy of the intervention, but the reverse argument is not necessarily true. 
meaning not everything that causes choroidal thickening can be used as a safe myopia intervention. Yeah. So this counter argument has been, uh, I would say, somewhat intentionally or unintentionally being brought into this field. So we need to be careful in understanding what is the mechanism of causing the choroidal thickening. Is this something that the body can take as a prolonged and repeated um, dosage? Is that causing any irreversible damage to the choroid and to all of the layers the choroid is supporting? Mm. And so I would be very, very cautious in saying, oh, this treatment elicit corridor thickening so it has to be a good myopia control treatment. across the board not just yeah. with this red laser yeah. but across the board you know i'm sure we can shoot th something some yeah. pharmaceutical into the eye that caused the choroid to get thickening yeah. but that doesn't mean that it's good for myopia or good for the eyeball of course yeah exactly wow. if you get a very high intensity laser to the macular area if the um the eye is smart enough the cord would think, oh, this is so much stress to this area, to such a piece of critical tissue. The first response choroid would do is to vasodilate and try to take as much of this stress, whether it's photodynamic stress or thermal dynamic stress. It's trying to take the stress away from such a critical area. That's why you're seeing this much vasodilation. That's the choroid's response of trying to elim eliminate uh, this harmful uh, stimulus. Yeah. So I, I can provide a co completely different hypothesis in explaining why we're seeing such a dramatic choroidal thickening. And I can argue this is not good for long-term use. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for all of us that are listening, uh, for now, red lights out. Not, not, not what we want to be doing until we hear more research uh, pointing towards it being effective. And, and right now, the, the, the jury's not just out. It's showing ineffectivity on LED, and sometimes it's effective. Blue light, sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not. And then the red laser, that's just out yeah. because it's really risky right now. Yeah, there have been sporadic case reports, both published in um, English journals, as well as ch um, uh, journals in Chinese, showing that um, months of using this device cause irreversible damage. That's very obvious on OCT. Some cases after the discontinuation and some anti-inflammatory treatment showed um, nearly complete recovery, but some other cases um, showed uh, some irreversible permanent damage. Mm -hmm. And so until we have further evidence supporting the safety of such device, I would not be too focused on the efficacy of the device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. look for other avenues. Yeah. Okay, since we're talking about light-based therapy, I wanted to run one other uh, series of um, light-based treatments for, for myopia by you and hear your perspective. So um, my resident and I did a, a series on violet light and how we aren't getting the, the violet spectrum of the light that we have because indoors our, our, uh, our bulbs don't show that, whereas when we're outdoors we see this. And in some adults and some kids that lacked violet light, they had a higher amounts of progression and maybe you could slow it down if there was more violet light in, in our system. So maybe not just staring at a violet light, but shifting the color spectrum that we have have you heard much about this and do you have some perspectives on that? Um, I'm not aware of any large-scale clinical studies. I'm mm -hmm. just studying changing or shifting the light spectrum or changing the distribution of the different uh, wavelength, um, the impact of that on myopia control. Mm -hmm. um, but commercially, I do see tons of different lamps of trying to mimic outdoor lighting yeah. uh, to sell it to anxious parents uh, with myopic children. Yeah. Um, I do have to say, to my knowledge, there's currently no technology that can mimic a natural outdoor lighting just yeah. using an artificial light source. And we don't yeah. think it's just the wavelengths of the light that are coming in that are slowing the progression when children are outdoor. Mm -hmm. There's other things that are going on which we can hypothesize. Yeah. Um, if somebody is thinking about getting a uh, changing light bulbs in their house, would you tell them 
not to do it because of harmful reasons? Uh, not really. I think it's more of the cost-benefit analysis. It depends on how much more expensive those uh, special mm -hmm. um, light sources are. If they are comparable, very, very energy efficient, and it's making the vision very comfortable, uh, go ahead and do yeah. it. But if it's 10 times or 50 times more expensive, that's actually what I'm seeing, yeah. especially in China, a reading lamp is selling for $250 US dollars, mm. where it doesn't really function too much different than a $10 lamp. Yeah. And so I'm not sure I would convince the parents to pay that more yeah. for something that's not evidence-based. Right, yeah. right. Uh, invest that money in myopia management, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely. One of the other aspects of this, I'll just point this out, in, a, in, in the studies or the papers that we read were also how it shifted our sleep, right? And so that may be an avenue of, you know, usually when we would wake up in the morning, you know, in... In, in prior days, we would get higher spectrums of different co wavelengths in our in our system, and and uh, then when we would go to bed, it would be that we would get it would get dark before we would you know be getting ready yep. for bed. So it would shift, um, you know, all the chemicals that would help us get to sleep and so forth. And so there's an aspect of that that could be beneficial for Absolutely. people in, in helping their sleep. And, Absolutely, you know, maybe yeah. roundabout help with myopia in that way if kids are sleeping more not on their phones as they go to go to bed and so forth. So there's certainly avenues and directions in understanding how we're using light that we still have a lot to learn outside and inside mm -hmm. of the myopia world. So yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. Absolutely, this is such a fascinating world. Myopia is presented in such a simple condition, but the mechanism behind the pathology and behind the treatment, it's so poorly under, under, understood. And so we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you for your research that you're doing to help us better understand it and how to better treat our patients. And thanks and for being thank on the podcast. And thank you for having me here to yeah. talk about this highly, highly controversial topic. Ah, yeah. well, I think you've helped make it so it's not as controversial. <laughs> I think we have a better understanding of what we need to be thinking about. So thank you. Sure. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes. And check out the Vision by Design meeting 2024, October 2nd through the 5th in Dallas, Texas. We hope to see you there. Both of us will be hanging out with you there. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I want to again thanks team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 